Today, I've had a couple of opportunities to talk to some really bright people that have a challenge where they need to go out and communicate to a exclusively executive audience. And I want to give you some stories that I relayed to them that I think will significantly help them in their ability to communicate with executives and might lay aside some of your beliefs about the type and level of conversations you need to have at the executive level. You ready? Let's go. Welcome to the process fix to help you see the bigger picture. Derek Maines is the elixir cut and based away like scissor. Woo! Got a problem, he can solve it. He's an expert with the process. So for sure you'll see a profit. Bottom line, profit. Analyze the work of people. Level. In the first instance, I was speaking with someone who needs to go out and do a presentation to a large group of CFOs. And in that presentation, I reminded them that many times senior level executives in larger organizations do not have their finger on the pulse as much as you might think. These are very intelligent people. They are, um, their decisions are moving hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, or millions of people in a specific direction as they lead and guide their organization. And you would think that they would be actively following events that are occurring and trying to determine if those things are threats to them or opportunities. I, I will just tell you in working with executives now for 25 plus years, that's just not the case. For the most part, executives are extremely focused. You would think that your worldview would broaden the higher up the chain of command you get in the hierarchical a hierarchical structure of organizations, that is actually completely false. Your focus narrows. You get very focused on the goals and objectives. And I gave the example from the book Switch, where if you haven't read that book, it's amazing. I mentioned it in my book, Adapt Agility. Uh, in the book Switch, they talk about this concept of the elephant, which is sort of our subconscious, our bias, our uh, our fast thinking limbic system, uh, mirror neurons, all of the things that sort of help us survive and adapt to environments um, and, and to do so very quickly and make snap decisions. And then on top of that elephant, I want you to imagine there's a rider and that's sort of your deep thinking brain that um, controls the reins of the elephant. But if you've ever ridden an elephant, I haven't, I'm assuming that it's, uh, you don't just gently tug on the reins. You, you, you know, if you want if you want the elephant to make a sharp left turn, you've got to hammer down on that and and pull that force that elephant to change the trajectory of its path. And I gave the example of the horse and rider, and I said many things like AI, like ChatGPT, like Bitcoin, um, decentralization, are like wild dogs that are nipping at the heels of the elephant, um, and uh, as the rider is heading down the path. Um, if you're in a senior level position, you, for the most part, are ignoring the dogs. They're not a huge threat to you. They are voices that are making noise um, that potentially could scare the elephant. But for the most part, you're keeping things under control and you're trying to move down the pathway towards whatever objective you're going for. Uh, on the flip side, if you look out ahead and you see a pack of wild dogs eating a dead elephant, in your pathway, well, now you're going to make some serious change. Both the elephant and the rider will adjust the trajectory. I like to use that analogy when I'm talking about things like ChatGPT because I think many times people are shocked. And I'll give you an example. This week, I spoke to an executive audience, very successful, um, higher mid uh, size companies, probably in that 500 to a billion, maybe a couple billion dollar range. And I was, uh, I don't want to say I was shocked because I wasn't. It was a little surprising how few of them had actually heard of ChatGPT. Chat Chat a number of them actually said, is it an app I can get on my phone? And went and got access to it as I was talking and were using it as I was talking. It was not in their purview in any way, shape or form. Now, these weren't technology CFOs. But even if they were, I would be surprised if they were experts on that technology just yet. 
for the most part, they're focused on their organization and driving their organization down a pathway towards objectives. Again, until the dogs form a pack and start consuming the elephants around you, you're not going to make a change. So I think it's important to understand how change is when you are talking to leaders in your organization and you're talking to them about the threat of AI, how AI can change things, you personally have to be very conscious that you have to take that conversation down to a level that is not, it's, it's much more remedial than you think in the initial conversation, but it will become much more strategic, much more quickly if you can identify uh, other challenges that are out there. If you talk about our competitor was recently consumed by AI and they've laid off 40% of their people, I as a CEO will be, we're talking about elephants, I'll be all ears, right? So that's something to think about. The second piece of that, I'm going to turn this fan off. The second piece of that was in coaching an executive, a senior leader in an organization, not a, a, not an executive by title right now, but acting as an executive inside their organization. And I reminded them that, that you know, he had, he had told me, I want to move up in my organization. There's some opportunity there. I need a little bit of coaching to get to that next level. And some of the advice that I gave this person um, had to do with things that I've learned in my own career and life. One of the things about executives is that they are very deliberate. And uh, there is a reason that there's a document called an executive summary. Why is that? Well, there's an executive summary out there because for the most part, executives aren't going to get into the details. They do not have the time, they do not have the energy, and it is not a good use of the organization's money for executives to get into the minutia of problems. The mistake that so many people make when you're in this VP level infrastructure where you have a lot of authority, but you aren't yet at that level where you're hundred percent strategic. You still have tactical things going on on a daily basis. The mistake that a lot of those leaders make is that when they're communicating up the chain, see people are communicating to them and they're giving them a lot of detail so they can make decisions. When you're communicating up the chain to CEOs and COOs and CFOs and CMOs, that is a terrible mistake to use the same methodology. Instead, what you should be doing <clears throat> is summarizing. You have to think about things like a punchline and you have to say, what is the pun? I don't need to tell the joke. I don't need the whole setup. I don't need the 600 emails that are associated with this. I don't need all the analyst reports. I don't need what my people are saying. I don't need any of that. I need a headline. I need a punchline. What is the story? Then right underneath that, summarize the three actions you need me individually to take. I don't want to hear, I'm going to do that. I don't need to hear that. I need to know I need resources. I need $25,000. I need it by Thursday the 15th so that we can take on this project, move this objective forward. And here is the quantifiable. Please don't ever say, my God, I said it the other day in an executive meeting. Somebody said, I feel like, and I said, F your feelings. I don't care about your feelings. Your feelings are not relevant when it comes to making strategic business decisions. It's not about gut. It's about data quantify what it is you need, exactly how many dollars, what is the expected return on investment, quantify that, and then below that, below that, you can give all the minutiae and details, charge graphs, PowerPoint presentations, all those kind of things. Executives, I promise you, will love you the second you start communicating this way. When you start communicating in their language of, tell me what the problem is, tell me the solution and get my approval. I don't need you to help me make the decision. If I'm trying to move up through the ladders of senior leadership and I'm asking you to help me make the decision, I have just disqualified myself from being an executive. I've just said, I'm not good enough. I need your help. I, I'm not doing that. I communicate with my clients and I say, I'm the expert. These are the three options. This is the path forward. This is the amount of money needed. This is the expected result. I need your approval on this by Tuesday. Now, sometimes they'll come back and say, we're not going to do that right now because it doesn't fit into the bigger picture of things. Okay, totally fine. I told you what I felt was right. I now have the, not that I'm ever going to use the, I told you so. They are smart enough to know in their mind that when something does go a little different direction and they go, oh, how could we have, how could we have assessed that risk earlier? And, well, 
th there's there it is, which then also validates me. I don't need my clients to listen to everything I say. I don't need them to implement everything I say. I need to give them diverse opinions and expert ideas about how I might do it differently. This is a great way to communicate. There's an old story in Silicon Valley I love to tell. I think it was written in Computer World in about 2004. And this man tells a story of his son who borrows the family car. He's 16 or 17 years old. Dad says, you got to be home by midnight. Of course, midnight rolls around. Son's not home, 12, 15, 12, 30. All of a sudden, the phone rings. Dad picks up the phone. His son says to him, I'm okay, Dad. The bull is dead. The car is drivable. Please come to the, uh, the this intersection. And he hangs up the phone. And the dad says, tells a story and he said, you know, for years I tried to become an executive and I always was told it was my communication skills that held me back. And he said, I got into the car that night, grabbed my wife out of bed and I got into the car and we started driving towards the scene of the accident. And my wife said, what, what's going on? And I said, I'm not really sure, but my son called, he said, he's okay. The bull is dead. Car's drivable, but we need to come to this location. And he said, that's when it dawned on me. And I realized that my son had just communicated all of the key points and all the key actions that I needed to do without giving me any of the minutia and details because my son didn't need to give me that. I didn't need to know what he was talking about. I was going to find that information out on my own if I needed it. And when I got to the scene, the police were there and they said, yeah, a big old cow walked in front of him and he hit the cow and the cow's dead. He's okay. He got the details and minutia when he needed them. But to take action at the senior level, you don't need minutia and details. But let me tell you something, you better damn be sure that you got them because on random occasion, I intentionally will do this. Somebody will bring it to me and I'll say yes three times. Okay, we're 25 for this, 50 for this, 100 for this. And then once in a while I'll say, you know, I'd like you to send me all the analyst reports. I want to see the spreadsheets. I want to see your calculations. I'd like to just get a little bit of a better understanding of how you make decisions. Now, I'm not doing that to try to be a jerk. I'm doing that because I want to make sure that the decisions that they're making are based upon qualitative information, not on feelings, number one. And number two, I want to dissect the way that they think. Now, I will tell you, I have caught senior leaders in the past that send me something and say, hey, we've done all the analysis, we've done all the work, and here's what we want to do. And they can't back it up. Well, guess what? Once trust is lost, Brene Brown talks about this. Once trust is lost, it's lost. Don't believe me? If you know anybody in your network, who one of the partners cheated on each other 20 years ago, listen to when they fight. Even if they forgave the partner for cheating, listen to when they fight, because what's the first thing that comes out? Well, I'll never forget, back in 1983, <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what happens. You can still forgive, you can still move on, but once trust is broken, it's broken, it's over. So I just advise as, a, as senior leaders, you should share this with your people and say, this is the way I need communicated with. I also love my wife's method. If she's going to communicate with a senior leader, somebody who's a number of tiers above her, she always explains to them ahead of time, I will be putting a color in the subject line. The color red means I need you to drop everything and immediately take action upon this. Yellow means when you have available time, I'm going to need a response. Green means I am invoking your name and CCing you on this email in order to accomplish a task that I could not do with my own, um, what, what, what's the right word here? My own sort of weight inside this organization, my own impact, my own uh, influence density is the word that I like to use there. I don't have enough influence density to make this happen. Therefore, I have CC'd you on it to frighten the person that I sent the email to into, well, let's not use frighten, to, to uh, encourage the person I sent the email to, to take action because they see, oh, my boss's boss's boss is on this. I better stop looking at Facebook and get what I need done. So those are some ideas and suggestions on how to better communicate with uh, with senior leaders. And I think if you adopt this, if you take this under consideration and you truly understand what it is, why it's important, and you use these methods, you will find yourself in a way, in, it, you'll, you'll find yourself working up through the corporate ladder. I'm going to give you one last one here. It's a technique I call see below sucks. What is see below sucks? 
I had an IT guy. I had a company years ago. A lot of people um, wanted to communicate with me, and they, they got into a habit of forwarding me communications to try to get my opinion on it. They'd get they'd have a back and forth with customer service with a customer, and the customer was angry, and they would send me an email that says, see below. And they would expect me, you know, with with as busy as I was dealing with shareholders, raising money, dealing with employees and HR and accounting and payroll and all these things, they would expect me, I guess this is what they would do. They'd expect me to spend the next 60 minutes reading through a huge diatribe of employee in customer communication. So I went to my IT manager at that company and I said, I want you to go and write a rule in our email that if the word see below is found anywhere in an email, it is immediately deleted from the server. And then I went out to my people and I said, look, I want you to summarize things for me. Tell me the bull is dead. Give me the punchline. And I, my wife used to have a little bull that she used to leave sitting on her desk to remind herself in communicating with executives, is the bull dead? What is the punchline? I have to do that first. So I actually did this in this company. We made this rule, see below sucks. And if you sent me an email that had the word see below in it, it was automatically deleted from the server and there was no possible way I could get a hold of it. That trained my people because you only have to do it once or twice. And then you come find me in the hall and you're like, what are we going to do about that customer? And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, I forwarded you. Oh, yep. Sorry, you forwarded it to me. You know what happens in this company when you forward things to me? The rule is they're automatically deleted forever from the server. Go back to your office, create a bull is dead outline. Give me the things that you need me to do. Help me understand the cost. Help me understand the benefit to the organization and to the customer. And then and only then will I reply. I hope this session was helpful and I hope it guides you from that middle tier level in your organization up to the executive level where you deserve to be. This is one of those things that will hold you back and will stop the best talent in the organization from ever hitting the upper echelon, it, it's it, it's the difference between that $150,000 a year and that $300,000 a year job. So I'd encourage you to adopt these techniques and make sure you check out more at DerekMains.com and make sure you follow. You ready? Let's go. Welcome to the process fix to help you see the bigger picture. Derek Mains is the elixir cut and waste away like scissor. Woo! Got a problem, he can solve it. He's an expert with the process. So for sure you'll see a profit. Bottom line, profit. Analyze the work your people doing every day. Expose the inefficiencies getting in the way. Advise you how to automate, outsource, abbreviate, eliminate, innovate. Now there's more food up on your dinner plate.